There we go. Hi everyone, I'm Nadine from Colin Campbell Chemicals here from Behind the Turf Podcast. Uh, still at GIS. Um, I'm glad to get my next guest on on the podcast. Uh, we did talk about it last year, but we're making it a reality this year. Uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kale Bigelow from Purdue University. I've known Kale for quite a few years and we always bump into each other at uh, GIS and getting to know more and more about each other. Kale, welcome. Welcome. Well, welcome to the United States, Nadine. It's good to have you here. No, th thank you very much. And I always enjoy um, GIS. And one of the things I do want to do one day is definitely get to visit you up in Indiana there. Uh, I would come in the summertime. You know, <laughs> your winter, my summer is a better time to that, be. So. Yeah, that's one thing I've got to do. The good thing, yeah, yeah it's towards the we're sort of middle of our summer, which is um, it was good to get away from the fires and the likes and actually get to see blue sky. <laughs> and that. So, um, Kyle, can you just the audience that we're talking to in Australia probably haven't heard of Purdue University so much. Can you give us a bit of a background on the university and, and your sure. role? Sure, it's, it's our, you know, it's the land grant university in the state of Indiana. So it would be similar to, you know, a Virginia Tech or a Penn State or a Michigan State or Ohio State. Um, you know, its focus is uh, agricultural sciences. Uh, probably its uh, global brand is um, most well known for uh, a lot of their engineering programs. Uh, you know, they're sort of claim to fame as first and last as far as astronauts on the moon. Um, so you know, those, those kind of aerospace engineering uh, endeavors are pretty important. Uh, in addition to that, you know, the basic sciences, uh, you know, chemistry, physics, everything along those lines. And then uh, we're extremely strong uh, in the agricultural sciences broadly defined. Uh, everything from, you know, what we do in, in specialty crops like turf grass, uh, you know, production agriculture, corn and soybeans is, you know, staple crops in, in the Midwest. Um, but then you get into our animal sciences and our ag econ and, uh, you know, everything else that's yeah. uh, involved there at the, uh, at the university. So uh, the history of the turf program, uh, it's actually pretty old. Uh, the leading turf grass or the, you know, the um, probably the most famous turf grass scientist at Purdue is a gentleman by the name of um, Bill Daniel. And Bill Daniel uh, was hired on um, in sort of the 50s, late 50s. And his tenure at the university lasted until the uh, 1980s. But he was, you know, some of those early pioneering scientists um, that, uh, you know, took things to the next level. Uh, uh, Dr. Jim Beard was actually Bill Daniel's PhD student. Okay. So, you know, uh, Dr. Beard learned from Bill Daniel and, um, you know, certainly had a, uh, you know, a very um, a notable career as a turf grass scientist, I think most people would, would say. Yeah, a lot of people in Australia did know him personally as well. And, uh, yeah, when, when he passed, a lot of, uh, yeah, there was a lot of uh, people that, yeah, I think, took the time, I think, uh, couldn't make the funeral, but they did pass on their wishes as well. So. Yeah. Um, so, th so that's kind of the background of, you know, where the program is. It's, you know, we're, we're located about three and a half, four hours directly east of the Ohio State University and about three and a half, four hours sort of southwest of Michigan State. And uh, so just to kind of give you the geography, it's, it's mostly cool season um, grasses that we deal with uh, at the university, but uh, we are also one of those sites that is northern zone of adaptation for some of our zoysia grasses and Bermuda grasses. If somebody is interested to see if their uh, germplasm is cold hardy, uh, they will send things to us and you know, we'll evaluate those. And you know, if, if it's got some potential, it'll maybe even make it into the marketplace. Yeah, okay. That's interesting. Have, have you tested any of the zoysia grasses for that? Uh, so I have a colleague that uh, does quite a bit of the zoysia yeah. grass testing. Um, you know, I primarily deal with the, the Bermuda grasses and basically all the cool season yeah. grasses. But um, uh, yeah, we're, we're always interested in cultivars and species. And I think that you were kind of maybe asked kind of what I work on and what I do. Yeah. And that's probably a nice segue for that. Um, but my responsibilities uh, on the research side is you know what are we finding as far as improved cultivars for golf turf lawn turf sports turf uh that's evaluation of bluegrasses evaluation of the turf type tall fescues mm -hmm. which maybe has a little bit of a fit in parts of yeah there's uh, a little bit of the the tall fescue not so much on the sports field more in the um lawn, lawn sure. care side yep there's a lot more but um, maybe, maybe even in golf course roughs or, or, or that, is, that that yes. outer rough kind of thing there, there, there is in the in that a lot of fine fescues are starting to be used to, there is still some tall fescues in rough yeah, as and, well and I, I do a lot of evaluations of uh, the creeping bent grasses for fairways and putting green turf yeah. 
Um, and, uh, you know, something else that's really important to us is, is water use. And yeah. we're uh, pretty active in trying to figure out, you know, ways to be more conservation minded on the water mm -hmm. side, you know, and that starts with right plant, right place. Uh, and, and identifying cultivars that maybe don't need as much water. And then you layer on top of that, the cultural things that you could do, everything from, you know, nutritional inputs or, uh, you know, some of the surfactant kinds of things, which, you know, maybe would be helpful in terms of reducing water needs for really any turf grass area. Yeah, no, no that is very important as well. It's like, it's all over the world. We, the population is growing, water is a finite resource, so we've got to use it the best way possible. And it's, and it's getting expensive. Yeah, it can get expensive, mm -hmm. but you know, more importantly, if you're thinking of the game of golf, you know, you, you, you know, green and gooey is no good. Um, and you know, the, the bouncy kinds yeah. of things that you see, you know, I think the, the championship that we just had at Royal, Royal Melbourne with the President's mm -hmm. Cup and you know, the way that things are running out and, and people kind of want that, but if you don't have the right things in place to kind of bring things back when you take them to the dry yeah. side, uh, that can be uh, not good for the golf long term with the facility. So, and there's quite a few golf courses within the area itself as well. So uh, we're about two hours south of Chicago, which is our big population center, uh, and we're located about an hour north of Indianapolis. And if you're familiar with auto racing, uh, oh, yeah. you know there, there's a, there's a, a lot of different um, auto racing tours that come through Indianapolis, whether it's you know the IndyCar, uh, F1, NASCAR, uh, even some of the motorcycle yeah. racing all come through uh through indianapolis so so yeah there's a lot there uh one of the things i also wanted to touch on was um, besides the work that you do was uh, the seminar that i came to last year that you did with mike fidanza mm -hmm. on soils and microbes it's a still a black art it seems we're learning a lot more than probably i remember when probably five ten years ago it was everything was speculated but it seems to be we know more but we're still only scratching the surface you're, you're exactly mm -hmm. right. I mean, you know, one of the things that when Dr. Fredanza and I put that together, uh, we just felt like there was there was a need for just, just fundamental information and, and an idea of uh, hope, hoping that our participants would able to, would be able to look at ingredient lists and have a sense for, you know, what kind of impact some of the things that would be in some of these products might actually have and, you know, what the, what the current science uh, has shown with those, you know, because like you said, it is a, it is a little bit of a, a mystery box. Uh, but I, I do feel like, you know, people like myself and, uh, you know, others that are working with the biostimulants, uh, they're, they're getting a little bit of a better handle on things. The, the big obstacle though is, is getting people to actually fund this work. And, you know, we kind of do it out of um, interest, but, um, you know, the funding piece is, is definitely a challenge to really find out what yeah. some of these do. Yeah. Are they, are we seeing the biostimulants um, getting better and, and having a much more an active role and, and being a benefit to turf grass? Um, I think the easy answer to that is yes, but, and you know, dot, dot, yeah. dot. Um, it, it's, it's, it's more and more um, understanding on how to use or when to use, or at least some of the ingredients that have pretty good track records. When you introduce something else into uh, the equation, suddenly things get very complicated. Um, but, but you have the liquid part, and I think that's important to say is, you know, we've got all these liquid products, but uh, we also have um, granulars that could be soil, you know, surface applied and somehow incorporated into the soil. Mm -hmm. So, you know, working on not just the top of the plant, but also the bottom in, in sort of a holistic kind of uh, way. And so I've always been a fan of, you know, good quality compost, yep. you know, in terms of building soils. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's a term that gets thrown around quite a bit, carbon-based fertilization. Yep. and you know, that's, that's kind of the, the mindset that I take with, um, with my approach to nutrition. Right. And with, um, I guess, the nutrition side, um, you know, there's been a lot of advocates for soil testing, been a lot of advocates for leaf tissue testing. Do you find that there's a place for both or one is better than the other? What, what, what do you think? I, I don't think that there, you know, necessarily one is better than the other, but I, I, if, I, if I only had so many resources and I only could do one thing, I would probably do the soil test. You know, the, the, um, the tissue test is such a moving target throughout the growing season based on so many things such as, you know, time of the year, how vigorous the grass is growing, you know, is it under stress and all. So that tissue test number really can, you know, bounce around. But, um, you know, the, the, the soil test generally doesn't change a whole lot, assuming you're sampling, you know, at the appropriate time of the year and, and have some sort of consistent lab results. I mean, you might get differences from lab to lab, 
but um, if you're reliably using something at a particular lab you're comfortable with and you have that relationship with that agronomist and you're always sampling at the same time of year and nothing crazy happens like you just did it right after a fertilizer application, um, you, can, you can start to get some trends and, 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 and not have such a you know, wavy curve and a more consistent curve of this is my target and this is where I'm headed. Would you look to test the same area on a regular basis or got a different grain so to speak Ooh, um you know I, I i think that you know that that's the kind of thing that you know sort of a good green bad you know or struck you know something that you're you, is a challenge not necessarily a bad green and maybe something intermediate or certainly you know something that's just rock solid and something that takes a little bit more of your time and and have those two for comparison that's probably the way that okay. i would approach that okay. And, and what do you think, lastly, I guess, um, the future of turf management, what, what are you seeing? Is it more to do with the soil, the microbe, what we can understand there more, or is it going to be coming from another, other sides? Um, you know, the, the seminar that Dr. Fidanz and I have, you know, done, uh, it deals with plant supplements. And, and, and I, we use that word intentionally because, you know, just like, um, you know, any athlete, and we're in an Olympic year, right? Yeah. And so you have all these Olympic athletes that, you know, you and I have a certain level of nutrition, right? Yeah, yeah his they, is better they, than mine. No, that's, that's, <laughs> not, that's not true. Some people, it's liquid nutrition, right? So... <laughs> Um, but when you start to think about, you know, what, what, what our base level of nutrition is, and then you start to think about, you know, if you're moving an individual into a high performance situation, um, and, you know, I'll give you an example of that. One of, the, one of the fastest swimmers in the world right now is a guy named Caleb Dressel. And so he's someone in American to watch for in the, yeah. uh, uh, in the Olympics this coming summer. But he is super fast, and we're talking 8,000 calories a day kind of guy. Wow. If you and I ate 8,000 calories a day, <laughs> we'd, we'd probably look like Jabba the yeah. Hutt. Uh, but he has a very high metabolism. But in addition to his base nutrition, you know, proteins and carbohydrates and all those other kinds of things, you know that there's a certain amount of supplements that, you know, his coaching staff and his trainers are, are looking at. Well, you know, I look at putting greens a lot like high performance athletes, you know, a race car, you know, yep. something that you're going to, you know, uh, something uh, that is sold quite a bit in the United States is uh, there, there's a material called um, Lucas oil supplements. Okay. Yep. And you put them into your, you put them into your gasoline and, you know, cleans your fuel injectors yep. and all those other kinds of things. That's probably not going to make a whole lot of difference to my minivan at home. But if I've got a Ferrari or a Lamborghini yep. that, you know, needs to be at that elite level, that's where the supplements kind of come in and, and maybe take things to the next level or avoid, you know, catastrophic failure when things get under extreme strain. And that's, that's kind of my mentality and, and how I talk to people about the supplement kinds of things. Yeah, that's a, that's but you also need way. to do your homework and, and um, you know, work with products that are consistent from year to year to year um, is really important too, that have a track record. Yeah. All right, Kyle. I really appreciate the time you've taken here today. I know it's yeah. been a long week. We are at the end, yeah, of, this, end of the show. It's, yeah, um, we're about, about to close it down yeah. and go have a pinter for no, 20. No, that, that sounds good. And how far is your flight here back to back home? Uh, so I don't leave till tomorrow morning, yeah. but it's only about a two-hour flight oh, back that, to Indianapolis. No, not and then an hour drive, and you know, I'll get home in time to see my wife and my dogs. So it'll uh, be all that, good. Uh, good. So, no, thank you very much, Kyle, I appreciate for being on the show. Yeah, it was awesome. uh, for, for everyone, I'll put on the show notes. I'll put contact to Kyle's on details. You can definitely follow him on uh, Twitter as well. But yeah, thank you yeah. again for awesome.